thank you for that very generous welcome and um, good evening to all of you. Um, and also thank you to that beautiful music, Hugo, Bob and Johnny. I feel really chilled now, which is really unusual before I approach you. Um, so I also just want to say, um, you know, thank you very much to Poets and, play and Players and Manchester Literary Festival for extending this invitation to me in this absolutely beautiful room, which feels like it was built to have poetry in its walls. Um, I'm also especially honoured to be reading alongside Ian, um, a poet that I've admired for many years and also just his generosity to the world of poetry. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to read from Small Hands, my, my little book, which came out last year. And, and actually, to be honest with you, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't believe there is a book in the world that uh, is mine. And the poems feel like they were sort of part of my body for such a long time and now they've sort of been released in the world. And um, so it's very, very special. And I'm still coming to terms with that. <laughs> So I thought I would uh, read a few poems from Small Hands, and then I thought I would test out some new work on you, if that's okay. <laughs> it's quite a scary thing to be writing new work after a first collection. Um, but I'll read um, from Small Hands first. So the poem I want to read first is called, is called Insomniac. Um, my father was a shift worker, and we lived uh, in very near Heathrow Airport with the planes every three minutes. And um, nearly everyone I knew at school worked at, at Heathrow Airport. Um, my poor father, um, his sleep patterns were really dysfunctional, even after he retired. But it was my poor mother who suffered. So this is really about my mother's suffering. It's called Insomniac. Never marry an insomniac. You will have to mind yourself. Have hemweight sewn into the lining of your garments. Cure your skin with almond oil until it's bloated and the pores are brimming. Purchase a large wooden grain trunk and place it near your bed. It's for safe keepings. Obscurely somewhere deep inside, you know all this. Very soon you won't be able to tell the days apart. You'll develop a tick and it'll distill at the centre within the hive of your other small anomalies. You'll flail in mild wind and when you speak, minute silverfish will consort in the pit of your throat. Exquisite wife to the shade, the exact point you place your fingertip on winter mornings, a raindrop will later stop and fret. It's a wonder if you survive at all. It'll all end in the mouth, you'll blink, he'll stir, you'll practice lying very, very still. Peacock feathers, your talismans, will blink back in their jaws. Um, the next poem I'll read is called um, What Every Girl Should Know Before Marriage. And this, um, in the Victorian days, there used to be these little self-help manuals for ladies. And this is my modern version the girls. What every girl should know before marriage. Eliminating thought verbs is the key to a successful marriage. You're better off avoiding the beach for specificity and curbing your interest in the interior of things. The cobra always reverts to type. Tuneless girls tend to wither on the vine. Oil of jasmine will arouse river fish. In the poetry of the Song Dynasty, the howling of monkeys in gorges was used to express profound desolation. Things you should have a good working knowledge of. Mitochondria, Roman roads, field glasses, and making rice, but using the evaporation method only. When your mother-in-law calls you smart, it's not meant as a compliment. The lighter her eyes, the further she'll travel. Always have saffron in your kitchen cupboard, but on no account ever use it. Taunt the sky during the day, the stars will be your hazard at night. Do not underestimate the art of small talk. Learn some stock phrases such as, they say Proust was an insufferable hypochondriac, or I'm confident that the government will discharge their humanitarian obligations. Fasting sharpens the mind and is therefore a good time to practice reverse flight. Your husband may not know that you cheated with a shop bought garam masala, but God will know. Um, he really will know. 
They, I think I'll just do one, one more poem with some more hands and, and read you some new work. Um, I'm really interested in form, and there's one particular form I, I love, which is the guzzle. Um, and it's, if you're not familiar with the guzzle, it's used a very, very beautiful form of poetry writ written um, and read in um, many countries, uh, in the Middle East and in India and Pakistan. And um, my father used to write the guzzle. And what's really lovely about it is it's in couplets and it has very long lines, so there's this real opportunity to score the voice musically, and it's often set to music. Um, so I thought it would be nice to read that tonight, today for you. Um, the kindling for the poem, I suppose, came from a, a play that I watched by Lorca, The House of Bernard de Alba, Alba, which is full of um, depressing, sort of suppressed women. Um, so, guzzle. I want to tune in to the surface beside the mayfly, listen to how she holds her decorum on the skin of the pond. I want to sequester words, hold them in stress positions, foronate them, string them up to ripen on vines. And I want to commune with rain and for the rain to be merciful, a million tiny pressures on my flesh. I refuse to return as either rose or tulip, but wish to be planted under the desiring night sky. I want to be concentrated to a line under the pleat of your palm and for it to radiate opalesque under shadow. And I want God's fingers to break and for you to watch as I fold my sleeve reveal each detail of my paling wrist. So that was the guzzle. Um, so, yes, here we, here, we go, here we go, some new work. Um, it's funny how you can have blind spots in relation to the tropes and themes in your, on your own work. Small hands is full of little things, brimming with sort of small things like birds, insects, jars, and it's also full of references to hair. Um, which I didn't notice, but other people have. Um, and so, actually, I decided to take the bull by its horns and actually write, uh, not an oblique poem, but actually a direct poem about hair. Um, there's going to be a lot of hair in the second collection, I think. So, uh, what I've written is a sestina. Um, and I, I've written two sestinas, and I don't think I'm ever going to write one again. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the sestina I've written, because... Um, <laughs> I'm really interested in exploring the Indian epic, the Mahabharat, which is uh, apparently the longest poem in the world. And in this um, epic is a queen called Queen Draupadi, and she's incredible. She's an incredible character. She's fearless, um, she's dark-skinned, she constantly is let down by the men in her life. Um, she's married to five brothers. And at one point um, in the epic, she's humiliated in the palace and disrobed. And she dis declares that she will not rebraid her hair again until she has washed her hair in the blood of the perpetrators of this terrible deed. So um, this poem starts in her voice and um, it's her walking out of the palace. Uh, quite traumatised, actually. Draupadi's hair. It was like the first time I used my eyes properly, but then I opened them again when I entered the walls of the old city. Sorry and sorrow heavy, I could barely walk until, uh, until I was received by a crowd of women who flinched when they saw my unbound hair. The smell of the river was still in my hair. They led me to their simple homes, their eyes never left me. I was known by these women. They found me a place to lie and again I suffered fevered for days and sleepwalked alone around the skein of the old city. You may have heard tales of the old city. Its breath so toxic I hid in the long hairs of the boar tree. Girls pitied me, walked away, shaking their heads, averting their eyes. I swear I'll never crave anything again. How to explain to innocents and women. Strange, too strange what men do to women. My anger is a yellow lake, the starved city can't contain it. When shall I begin again? 
Five sons, five brothers never reach my hair. It is as if the mountains blind the eyes of the sky and I need to rehearse and walk. I learn these women and I learn to walk around my feathery shadow. Women hold my stories fast and within their eyes are tiny blessings. Soon I'll leave the city when the new light comes in and rinses my hair and things slowly reveal themselves again. Look, I've begun to turn porous again. Mothers tell us to dream of corpses, walk through rice pale faces and as for my hair, never speak of it to another woman. I am Draupadi, your queen, the city jangles under the weight of my eyes. Soon I'll walk away from this city. The women prepare me carefully again, and my eyes, they'll tumble out into my hair. So I think there's a lot more hair in the, in the, in the coming months, I think. Um, so I should have said actually at the beginning that um, one of the themes in the book, very clear themes, I suppose you could call it a theme, is the quiet core of the book are elegies to my brother who died whilst I was writing the book and I loved him very much and um, so I, there, there is a poem actually that I suppose would have gone into the collection of small hands but I just didn't feel it was ready um, and I'm not really sure now where it fits because I'm in a sort of different imagin imaginative zone now and it didn't go into the collection but it feels like a really important poem so I'll read that to you, it's called Everywhere for my brother. Mostly we are waiting for rain. Sometimes we let it fall gently on our faces. This is what a flower does. Yesterday I saw his eyes in the eyes of a young man next to the water fountain. We tell the children we should not look for him. He is everywhere. He is everywhere. He need, we need not look in the black sunflower seeds we take out for the finches or between the blind echoes of our prayers. After rain, we lift up sheets of canvas, like our own private church. We expect no answer. Nothing stirs, though he must be there. Um, just two more poems. This poem um, is also about my brother. And actually, all I'll say is that, um, I'll tell you that there was a gecko involved in writing this poem. Um, and my brother in this poem comes back as a ghost to visit his sister in the kitchen. Sorry, this sounds really depressing, but it's not. It's a wonderful poem. Um, and he's, he's my younger brother, but he's being like, quite wise and brotherly and giving me advice, like I should go and learn to swim because I can't swim. Um, so this is called A Pair from the Afterlife. By now, the light is failing. His face is fading, though. In the window, our heads are floating like balloons in the glass. In his deafness, he never looked more alive. Sis, you got to let go of this idea of definitive knowledge. Don't look on it as a journey, more like a resettling or dusting off or retuning of the radio. There are elm trees here, and those geckos slip surreptitiously under the door from my side to yours, and we suck on pebbles for comfort. Someday, you should learn to swim, toss the bread in the water, agitate the shy fish, lay down in the last hour of light, wait for the stars to fuss and faint against their cloth, and then listen to the rising chants of the sap, the grasses, panting all around you. Too bad you have to go back, I say. And he sighs like an old man, impatiently reteaching a child. The scent of seawater drifts from his hair. There are so many ways of looking at the moon. You should trust the rain again. Before you go, I say, will you bring me a pear from the afterlife? Or a ripe papaya? an accidental patch of clover, or something that has roots and grows in your silent soil, something that can live on my tiny balcony. <sighs> okay. 
Um, so the last poem I'll read, um, uh, again, really comes from a very different space. I've been trying to write this poem for a little while. I, I used to be a human rights lawyer. I don't know if anyone knew that, but I did. I, I worked at Liberty for a, a decade. And as I'm writing, um, more and more I, I keep making this link, and I want to explore this link between um, human rights and dignity of the person and the very human and natural act of poetry, which I think is a very, very human act. Um, and this poem, I suppose, um, started, uh, start, uh, began around two years ago where the Nigerian girls were taken um, uh, with uh, Boko Haram. And I don't know if you saw the images yesterday of some of the girls being reunited and uh, actually I thought I, might, I will bring this poem. But the voice of the mother could be any mother, I suppose. And this is my last poem. It's called Sabah is Missing. This morning, I sat on the vibrating bus again, as mute as dawn, conjuring you. A sequence of sensuous curves, your skull like a stricken egg. Waiting is like this. Sometimes I roll up my tongue, tip my head back and swallow it whole. I place my naked feet in your shoes and talk to slack mouth prophets standing in the polluted shade. Where is she? Where is she, I say. Carry on like this, they'll take you away. Saba, my unbending girl, dares not ruffle the air. I'll tuck her in again sometime with her secret name, Temenushka. My violet daughter, I'll kiss your dry lips again, the long, damp strangeness of your fingers. I stretch to kiss. Sometimes I stand under a low roof, dirty the window with my dirty hands. Watch for rain. See, it falls like stitches now, fringing the surface of the open moon. And I can smell the river of her in my hair. And oh, my child's bony breath. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>